Welcome to Conversations in North Dakota History, sponsored by the State Historical Society of North Dakota. I'm Virginia Heidenreich from the State Historical Society. Today we're going to be talking with Frank Vizralek of Bismarck, former archivist for the State Historical Society, about image as artifact, early photography, and North Dakota photographers. Frank, today I'd like to start out by asking you about what earliest photographers came into North Dakota? When did they come in? Who were they and why were they here? Well, the earliest photographers came in as part of uh, military expeditions. Uh, the United States established a tradition early in the 19th century of uh, whenever an exploration a group was sent out to explore uh, in the western United States, they took along scientific people. And of course, as uh, soon as the technology photography was available, uh, photographic equipment went along. The earliest we know of was in 1853 when John Mick Stanley, who was sent along on the Stevens Railroad Survey uh, as the illustrator, the artist who was to record what they saw, the things that they saw. Uh, in August 1853, according to uh, Stevens diary, uh, Mr. Stanley was using a daguerreotype camera at Fort Union, taking uh, daguerreotypes of the Indians. After that, it's kind of bits and pieces through the 1850s and 60s as photographic equipment became a little easier to handle, a little easier to take along, more portable. Uh, they were brought along on different military expeditions and particularly groups that were traveling up the Missouri River. What sort of images did these first photographers project about North Dakota? What kinds of um, ideas did they convey to whoever would see these images about actually the territory at that point? Well, if they focused, on, they tended to focus on people. And of course, the people who were here were the Plains the Indian tribes. Uh, the photographic equipment really wasn't good enough as far as the images were concerned to do a real good job with landscapes and that sort of thing. There are some early photographs of buildings. I think one of the most famous early photographs is of the, the one of the bastions at, uh, at Fort the uh, Trading Post at Fort Berthold. And some early photographs were taken of Fort Union, other fur trade posts. Uh, the problem you have there is that an awful lot of these have not survived to this day or have survived in a somewhat altered form uh, in the format of a, uh, a painting. Uh, an etching, a, an engraving that was made from the photograph, from the daguerreotype, the ambrotype, or the regular photograph later on. Now you made reference to the kind of equipment, at least suggested that it was somewhat limited, the kind of equipment they had to work with. Could you describe what these earliest photographers had to use as far as equipment and, and uh, supplies and so forth went out on the prairie? It was pretty, pretty cumbersome. Um, Photography in its earliest days was uh, best used in a studio, best used in a static environment. Uh, the cameras were large, they were rather clumsy, they were built mostly of wood. Uh, the lenses were not bad, but uh, they required some, uh, uh, they improved as time went on. The process was what was most difficult. A daguerreotype, for example, is an image uh, made on a uh, burnished uh, metal plate. And I, it had to be developed uh, using ammonia fumes, if I remember correctly. And of course, trying to do something like that out in the air in the wind of North Dakota, obviously it was as windy then as it is in uh, today, uh, made for an awful lot of difficulties. Now, even later, when more uh, the photographic process was a little more like what we're used to today. Uh, the photographers were found it necessary to literally make their own film as they went along. Uh, they, make the, they used glass plates. Uh, they made wet plate emulsions using uh, collodion and other chemicals. Uh, they had to keep those plates wet, which was not an easy process. They had to keep them, of course, away from light, uh, then they had to get them into the camera, expose them, and then get them back uh, into a, a box, keep them wet until they could be uh, developed or processed, uh, 
it was a very cumbersome procedure, and when you think about uh, all of the possibilities there are of, of having difficulties, and sometimes it's really amazing some of the early photographs were made the way they were. Uh, they, most, most people interested in photography of the Civil War era uh, relate to uh, the so-called what's-it wagons that uh, Matthew Brady and his photographers used on the Civil War battlefields. That's kind of emblematic of what they had to deal with because uh, the equipment that you needed uh, was more than enough to go into a wagon, a four-wheel wagon pulled by a horse. Maybe you could describe one of the earliest photographers that you were particularly interested in that had quite a bit to offer in terms of their interpretations of North Dakota, to give us an idea of, of an individual in this kind of setting. Well, probably the, one of the most interesting individuals was uh, Frank J. Haynes, F.J. Haynes, or just simply J. Haynes, as he's, as he's uh, known now was certainly probably one of the most uh, financially successful photographers of his day. Uh, started off as a young man in the 1870s, so that meant he had to deal with the, uh, this cumbersome wet play, play, play process. Uh, started off with a small studio in Moorhead, Minnesota. About uh, six years later, he set up in Fargo, and uh, in the earlier mid-1890s, he moved his headquarters to St. Paul. Uh, he was one of the, he was very quickly uh, became aware that if he was going to be a successful photographer, I think successful not only financially, but successful from a, uh, the standpoint of being known as an artistic photographer, he was going to have to get out of the studio. And so if you, if you follow him using his, uh, his own notes, his own correspondence, or even the contemporary press, you found that he was traveling an awful lot to take those photographs of events uh, places of things uh, in western Minnesota and in North Dakota of the 1870s that were valuable, that uh, people would buy uh, to uh, either remind them of what uh, the West looked like, show them what the West looked like, uh, to demonstrate that uh, uh, there, was a, uh, there was an important area out here. He got into uh, agricultural photography very early, uh, particularly working with some of the Bonanza farms in the Red River Valley. Uh, Bonanza farms were very important, particularly as far as the Northern Pacific Railroad was concerned, because they were interested in trying to change the image of the Great Plains uh, until uh, Civil War times, and even there, even after. Uh, the Great Plains were pretty much considered uh, the Great American Desert, an area where really nothing would grow and people really didn't want to to go to live unless they uh, had a good source of water uh, to uh, both for drinking water and for uh, agricultural purposes. And so the railroad promoted Bonanza Farms and it wasn't very long after uh, Haynes got started in the 1870s that he started photographing these farms as an image of the change that was going on up here. And Partly as a result of that, he was able to work a deal with the uh, Northern Pacific Railroad and become a, the, what they called the official photographer. Uh, they bought an awful lot of his work. They would send it uh, broadcast in the fourth of in the way of prints uh, as the uh, process of projecting slides, magic lantern slides as they were called, uh, was developed. Uh, Haynes' work was used for that. and. It was, it was used to indicate to the people of the United States that the Dakotas, the other states on the Great Plains, were not an arid area. They were a place where uh, if you were a farmer or if you were interested in agriculture, and most people in the late 19th century were, this was a place to come to put down roots and to, uh, to work toward making yourself a success. Now, you've talked about Haynes, who in a sense did settle in this area. He, he stayed here long enough to get kind of a feeling for what there was in the region. He, of course, had his, his biases. He wanted to emphasize productivity and mm -hmm. so forth. But what about some of the photographers that maybe just traveled through rather quickly, didn't, didn't really set down roots so much as to just go through the area? Were there some of those working that had a little different picture of North Dakota? Uh, 
Well, some of them, a lot of them did just pass through. Uh, one of the more interesting ones is one of the men named Stanley Morrow, headquartered in Yankton, uh, South Dakota. But again, he recognized that there was a great curiosity to what was going on up the river and uh, at the military posts, at uh, where the first areas of settlement were coming out. And he tended to travel into North Dakota in the 1870s and left, with us, left us with a number of uh, interesting images of uh, what was there in the 1870s. Now, other photographers came through as part of uh, military expeditions. A man by the name of uh, uh, William Illingworth, a St. Paul photographer, uh, came into the uh, what is now North Dakota in 1866, accompanying uh, one of uh, the Fisk uh, expeditions taking gold miners across the state into Montana. His photographs uh, were among some of the first that still survive today that show what the terrain was like uh, in the state. Unfortunately, Illingworth didn't have, uh, was not well enough along as far as capital was concerned to, to uh, publish his own photographs. He had to sell his negatives and the rights. Uh, but they were some of the first images to show uh, what the state was like and what was going on in the state in the pre-settlement time. He was back again in 1874, and he accompanied the, uh, the so-called Custer Expedition, the uh, Black Hills Expedition that went from Bismarck to the Black Hills to see if, in fact, there was gold in the Black Hills, and, of course, they, they did find it. Uh, his, the negatives from the uh, 1874 expedition were saved after he, was, after he died, uh, they were sold to the uh, South Dakota Historical Society about 1900, and a few years later the North Dakota Historical Society acquired uh, good contact prints of them, and uh, they are some of the real first illustrations of, uh, of life in North Dakota, and of course life in North Dakota then primarily uh, revolved around the military posts and the few towns that existed. Now, you've talked about photographers with kind of a variety of backgrounds. What, how did a photographer become trained who, who tried to come out during this period? Were some of them advanced in their careers? Were some of them really learning as they went when they came into the Dakotas? I think, that's, I think learning as they went to a certain extent is true. Um, I don't think, in the, at least in the earlier days, uh, except for someone like uh, John McStanley, who obviously had not had an awful lot of experience with a daguerreotype uh, camera and may in fact have learned as he worked his way across the country. In later years, uh, these people were pretty well experienced. Uh, I think the tendency was to learn through a sort of an apprenticeship as a youngster to just simply go to work for a, uh, a uh, photographer, an operating photographer, commercial photographer, and learn from him uh, the techniques, uh, the different ways of operating a camera, the different settings for uh, studio work, and that sort of thing. I'm also curious, you've made mention of a few ways that these photographs were disseminated, how the public in the East, for example, um, was able to get a picture of, of North Dakota. What ways were, was pho photography transmitted during those times? Obviously, it was fairly early in the history of photography still. Yeah, marketing, marketing photo uh, photographs was kind of a difficult thing in the 19th century because it wasn't, I think, until we got into the 1890s that photo engraving processes uh, were successful enough that they could, uh, you could put together a catalog of images and people would be able to buy from uh, the images they saw in the catalog. They did sell from catalogs, but usually from titles. Uh, short uh, descriptive titles. Uh, Haynes recognized this very early, and almost from the time he first started operating in the uh, mid-1870s, you find almost all of his uh, stereos and his uh, uh, full-size plates with a number and a short descriptive title. Uh, he put those on apparently when he, when he was first processing them, and then that became the identification that, would, that went into the printed catalogs that he uh, that he sent around the country. As as of course he became more uh, as better known as a uh, photographer from this area, a dependable photographer. Uh, 
Now, as far as local marketing was concerned, that was a little simpler. Uh, if you've seen photographs, for example, of a photographer's studio, the walls were literally covered with finely framed images of the man's work. In other words, the, the work was there to advertise what he was doing and the quality of his work. Sometimes uh, photographers, too, would set up uh, uh, cases set on the side of a building where he'd exhibit his work. And uh, they would offer it, offer it for sale and would encourage people to come in and buy copies, not only for themselves, but, <clears throat> but to send away to friends, uh, business associates in the East, and so forth. And the photographs usually showed the unusual things, the important things, the, the, the important buildings in a town, uh, the unusual things that had happened. Uh, a lot of steamboats, of course, were something uh, that were important out here, and they were sort of an image a, uh, uh, to people in the East. And of course, steamboat pictures, therefore, were very popular. Indian pictures were particularly popular. Now, you've made a couple mentions of Indian photographs. Who, who among the photographers you've studied were particularly interested in Indians and maybe had some special insights into them, or at least made images that were very widely popular of the Indian people in the area? Well, the image of the American Indian was, was very important from the beginning, partly because the American public was very curious about who were these people out here. They, I, I think probably in the late 19th century, maybe one person in 10, one person in 20 had ever seen it, the American citizens had ever seen an Indian. Uh, yet. The news was full of what was going on out here on the plains, uh, not only Indian wars, but interest in Indian culture. And so photography of Indians was something that, that got rolling and was very important, uh, not only culturally, but financially, for some of the early photographers. Uh, one of the first in this area to do a lot of Indian photography uh, was a man by, that, by the name of Orlando Goff who arrived in the earlier mid-1870s and uh, set up a studio at uh, Fort Abraham Lincoln. He did some travel to some of the Indian reservations and developed a, uh, a fine set of uh, so-called Indian plates. Uh, whenever any of the major figures of, in of uh, Indian history of that period came through, he was on hand to take their photograph. That included uh, Sitting Bull. That included Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce. Uh, he was followed by the man who was probably, I think, today is recognized as having the, done the, some of the finest work on the, uh, as far as the Indians of the Northern Great Plains was concerned, and that's David F. Berry. Uh, Berry arrived out here in 1878 as sort of an apprentice to Goff. But not long after, went off on himself by himself. Uh, he, was, he turned up at Fort, uh, at the military post of Fort Buford, in the late 1870s, with a portable studio, studio just about the time that uh, Sitting Bull and some of his followers were starting to filter back into the United States from Canada. And he photographed a number of them. Some of the best known uh, Indian photographs, the one of Gaul, uh, I think of as particularly, were things that. Uh, uh, and it rain in the face were things that Barry photographed about 1879 or 1880 in that tent studio that he set up at, uh, at, at Fort Union. Uh, after several years, he, he, he made his headquarters at uh, Bismarck, rented or leased Goff's studio after Goff moved further west, and set up a uh, branch studio at Fort Yates. And during the years approximately from 1884 to 1890, he made uh, the vast majority of what are now recognized as Barry's uh, Indian photographs. As a matter of fact, when he left Bismarck in 1890, uh, he took with him about 1,000 or 1,100 glass plates of what he, what he considered his finest work, most of it Indian portraits. And through the rest of his life, which was spent at uh, Superior, Wisconsin, and I think he died, if I remember right, in the early 1930s, to a good, to a certain extent, his uh, his income was based upon selling prints from those photographs of Dakota Indians made in the 1880s. Uh, he was uh, followed at uh, Fort Yates by a man by the name of Stephen Fansler, uh, who 
is not quite as well known. I was not quite as prolific. He was coming at a little bit of a later time when things had settled down. But he was, Fanzler was followed in 1900 by the man who was probably our in-state expert on Indian photography, and that was Frank Fisk. Fisk grew up, was born and grew up on the frontier. Uh, as a matter of fact, his father was a soldier. His middle name was Bennett, simply because he was born at Fort Bennett on the Missouri River in what is now South Dakota. Uh, he seems to have learned photography as a youngster. Uh, from uh, Fanzler, hanging around Fanzler's studio at, at Fort Yates. And in 1900, he got word that Fanzler would not be coming back and got permission from the commanding officer of, of the military post to take over and use the equipment that was in the studio there. And as a teenager, he became a commercial photographer. And uh, grew, as I say, he had grown up with the, uh, the Indian people of, uh, of the, of the uh, Standing Rock Reservation, knew many of them personally, and at least initially did not photograph them too much, but beginning after the military post was abandoned about 1903 or 4, began concentrating on Indian photography and became, I think, in my own mind, probably as, as expert as David Barry, except that instead of only spending about a decade at it, Frank Fisk spent most of his life photographing Indians. It's interesting, though, how uh, Fisk's view of what the Native American, how the Native American appeared. Uh, Berry, uh, Fanzler, Goff, even Haynes tend to tended to photograph them as they were at the time that they, uh, at that particular time. Frank Fisk seemed to have this fascination with the Native American as a figure for the 19th century, and I think this kind of a takeoff on uh, uh, on several other photographers who were, who were active at that time. Uh, because while he did photograph, obviously, the, uh, the, the Indians of the Standing Rock Reservation, as they were in 1905, 1910, 1915, 1920, and so on, in contemporary garb, even so, the, the best, with the, the photographs that he considered his best work, uh, that he copyrighted, and that he sold as the image of the uh, uh, Native American from the Standing Rock Reservation were those that showed them strictly in ceremonial garb, in 19th century garb, uh, with, with uh, dogs, travois, in other words, the image of the noble aborigine of the, of the uh, misty past of the 19th century. And if you read some of the things that Fisk wrote, that's the way he viewed them. That was preserving them any way that he thought proper, even though um, he dealt with them on a, at a time when most of them probably wore bib overalls, just like any other American and uh, rural American in the United States. Well, that was a period of time when the idea of the vanishing Indian was very prevalent, mm -hmm. and it really fed into that, the idea that if you simply showed the way they were, you could preserve that, but you couldn't expect anything of interest in the present. And that was unfortunate because we, we miss some kinds of documentation that we could currently use if there were more accurate pictures taken during that time period, even though Fisk's photographs are, are some very beautiful images, too. Well, fortunately, we've got uh, somewhere along the line, shortly after Frank Fisk died, about 1950, most uh, of his plates, uh, the glass, early glass plates and the celluloid plates from later, went to the State Historical Society. And among them, they, they, they're a source that really has not been well mined, I guess is a ter good term you could use. Uh, there, are, there are photographs showing uh, the, uh, the Indians of Standing Rock as they were during these time periods. The difficulty with working with them is most of them are, I would say, probably 75 or 80 percent of them are unidentified as to persona, as to the, who the people they are, and most of them are unidentified as far as time period is concerned. I think it's a collection that can be worked with, but right now it, we're about was, we're in a position that you say simply because of the condition the collection is in. It needs a lot of work, uh, and over time I think it will become more of a valuable collection showing what uh, 
the Native Americans of that area looked like through the 20th century, not just the image from the 19th. What other kinds of images were given of Indians that you can recall, beside the idea of the sort of the noble savage? Um, maybe into the 20s, were there any other photographers that did try to convey the, the reservation period and the, the changing uh, there, there were a few. livelihoods? Um, Fan, Stephen Fansler, who operated in the 90s, uh, for whatever reason, at least of the prints that I've seen, and oddly enough, they come from the, the things that went to the Historical Society from uh, Frank Fisk's collection, seemed to have a fascination with the Indian police. There's a large number of photographs of the Indian police in uh, the images of Fansler we have showing them either at work or sitting for portraits with uh, in uniform, which of course is instantly recognizable and very prominently displayed is the badge that they wore, the badge of their office. Now we've talked a little bit about photographs of people, at least in terms of Indian people. What about other groups? Were there, there certainly were a lot of different ethnic groups, uh, European ethnic groups settling in North Dakota. Were there any photographers that set out to uh, convey ideas about other groups than the Indians? There were a few. Uh, I've never been really sure whether some of these uh, photographers were, were trying to portray ethnic groups as they appeared in, uh, going out of the way to portray ethnic groups as they appeared after they came to the New World, after they settled in North Dakota, or that they were simply unconsciously photographing things as they were. Um, Probably one of the more successful photographers in the valley in the early 20th century was a man by the name of Jacob Scribseth, who started at Moorhead, Minnesota, moved up to Buxton, and then settled in at Hillsboro, where he was probably one of the most successful and most active photographers in the early, uh, early years of the century and the, and the late 19th century. Um, another man who consciously or unconsciously left behind some fine ethnic uh, photography <coughs> Excuse me. was uh, Ambrose Osborne in Dickinson. Uh, Osborne uh, started off by buying a studio in 1896 that uh, Orlando Goff had set up. And Dickinson, at the turn of the century, was really two, uh, two cities. The north side was much like any other Yankee-based community in America. On the south side, however, was basically a enclave of German Russians, uh, Ger uh, German Russian Catholics, uh, German Hungarians, and other ethnic groups from uh, Eastern Europe. And he ventured into uh, and photographed some of that. Uh, there's one particular photograph that I found fascinating of a, uh, of a German Russian woman, an elderly woman, wearing a babushka. Uh, that I think we've seen now. It's been used, the Historical Society had one of uh, Osborne prints back in the 70s, and we discovered it, and it's been used for a lot of different things. But it's, so it's probably a fairly well-known photograph. But I don't think that even Osborne consciously went over all, after a lot of those photographs, because what they were trying to do was portray the idea, the image of America as they perceived it at that time. And it was at a time when people bell believed that not only was this America a melting pot for ethnic groups, but the melting pot was melting. We've discovered since then it really hasn't melted as much as we as they thought. And so the, the, the things they concentrated were this, uh, were the sort of upbeat, progressive things. Uh, thinking of Osborne's photographs, you find a lot of pictures of uh, early automobiles out there. This, this was symbolic of progress, as, at least as they tried to uh, exemplify it for people uh, outside of North Dakota. We're trying to show we're just as progressive and as modern as anybody else. And you see that sort of attitude, too, in the contemporary press. You've talked almost really entirely about men photographing in North Dakota. Were there any women out there taking pictures? There were an awful lot of women photographing in North Dakota. If you go back through, you go through uh, business directories, uh, listing commercial studios in the 80s, the 90s, and at the turn of the century, you would invariably find women's names there. Unfortunately, we still don't know an awful lot about many of them, 
because very little of their work was left behind. Another side of the coin was, too, that many of the women, women who were working in photography were working in the shadow of their husbands. They were supposedly assisting their husbands, although in many of the cases they were doing fully as good or better work as that their husband did in the studio or even uh, in, in terms of landscape photography. Uh, several, uh, several of them that did able to, uh, were able to make a, uh, a name for themselves after they were able to get out from behind their husband's shadow. And one good example was a woman by the name of Vina Turk. Uh, her husband, Otto Turk, set up a studio in uh, Jamestown about 1910. And several years later, he died. And for whether by inclination uh, or uh, whether she had no choice, she needed to be able to make a living, uh, Vina Turk took up the operation of the studio under her own name and became a fairly well-known uh, photographer in the Jamestown area. She operated probably until about world, the beginning of uh, World War I. Another one uh, that always is kind of as intrigues me uh, was a Mrs. Welch, a Mrs. Charles Welch in Mandan. Uh, she came with her husband to Mandan about 1900. And they set up a studio and they operated it on the uh, east end of Main Street in Mandan. And suddenly one day in uh, March 1904, I think it was, uh, her husband walked out on her for reasons, since, you know, since the story came from a newspaper, it doesn't give you all the reasons for these things happening. But the fact of the matter was he left her with a baby and $3.10 in the bank account. And on top of that, to add insult to injury, he also carried off uh, what was the most portable bit of wealth they had, and that was the, uh, the lenses for the, cam for the studio cameras. So she was left uh, stranded in Mandan, and exactly how she was able to raise the money, whether uh, she had relatives who loaned it to her or she was able to borrow it, because uh, then, even as today, a lot of women, have, women find it difficult to obtain credit uh, she set the studio up, and she kept it operating, and she operated in, uh, in Mandan, I think, for about four or five more years before she disappeared, moved on somewhere else. Uh, the best-known woman in early North Dakota photography, of course, is another person from Mandan, or the Mandan area, and that's Na uh, Nancy Christensen, or as we know her now better as uh, her married name, Nancy uh, Hendrickson. And she died just a few years back. Uh, her home was on the Hart River west of Mandan. Uh, she grew up there, and she did a lot of her photographic work there. Learned photography from two older brothers, uh, but indulged mostly in neighborhood photography because uh, she was the one, as so happens to so many unmarried women of that age, who was designated to take care of the elderly mother until the mother died. And so a lot of her early photographs show the homestead claim, show the river, uh, shows life in a rural area. And they're, they're disarmingly uh, frank. Uh, they're very unusual. Some of the earliest uh, really kind of candid photography uh, that I've seen for, for North Dakota. She did a certain amount of studio work, again, working with her brothers. But where she be her frame began to spread was uh, entering her photographs in county fairs across the state of North Dakota. And she won many awards, some of which brought in cash, some of which just simply say, uh, served to enha enhance uh, her fame. And I think then she got into the, uh, into the Depression times, which in North Dakota were the 20s as well as the 30s, and she started doing some of the, uh, I think, the things that she was best remembered for, and that was animal photography, uh, working particularly with uh, the small herd of cats that she raised and, and, and kept uh, at her farm home, um, simply taking uh, advantage of our American tendency to anthropomorphize animals and dressing them up in clothes uh, and in human stances photographing these and uh, selling the photographs to magazines, to other publications, or as uh, postcard photographs to people, anybody who was interested. She made a real, real reputation for herself as a result of that. She must have been considered a little bit of a character to take on such a strange subject. Yeah, she was. And you look at her photographs and you see a certain amount of that, too. The first photograph I uh, 
I saw of her showed her with kind of a fuzzy little bundle in her lap. And I, I looked at the uh, description on the back, and she was holding her pet baby coyote, um, which is in her, I suppose, unusual enough in itself. She liked animals, and apparently she had a, had a uh, was masterful way of working with them. And of course, it shows in, in a lot of the photographs that she took. It's a good thing the SPCA wasn't around in those yeah. days, or at least not so active. Bob Barker would have had a hemorrhage, but uh, I guess that's another argument. <laughs> were there some other photographers that were considered kind of characters of their day that come to mind? Oh, let's see. Give me a tip. <laughs> <laughs> Ones that just had strange personalities or had odd topics they took pictures of that... Um, we're, we're sort of flamboyant. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the ones that always has kind of intrigued me is a, uh, a man by the name of Holmbo. Fred Holmbo. Well, he was a Norwegian immigrant. Uh, the name was better was really Frithjof, and of course that's why everybody called him Fred. It was a lot easier to pronounce. He got his start in photography working with uh, Haynes Railroad Studio Car. I guess to back up a little bit. Another way Jay Haynes had of, uh, of uh, projecting himself across the country, and of course being a successful businessman, was beginning about 1886 when he made a deal with the Pullman Car Company to convert a Pullman car into a studio, a railroad studio on wheels, a photographic studio on, on railroad wheels. Uh, he operated with it for a certain time, but after that it was operated by people who were hired for that purpose, and several well, the people who learned photography in the Haynes studio wound up in Bismarck, one of which was a man by the name of William Butler, who operated here for from about 1906, I believe, until 1910, when he died. And then his wife took over, Virginia Butler, another case of a wife coming to the fore after her husband died. And she operated here until the 1920s. Um, Hombo learned his work with the Haynes studio. Matter of fact, he was one of, among the last. Uh, before the studio was retired, uh, he came out here. was a tr was much like Haynes, a tremendously ambitious individual, incredibly energetic, and he recognized that Bismarck. One of the reasons Bismarck was important was because it was a center of government, and so he set to work to get as much government work as he could. Uh, he went to the State Historical Society and asked to be designated the official photographer. Uh, they did so. Uh, it didn't cost them anything. And so he would photograph historical society events. He, he got to know most of the political people. And uh, there's photographs today, very good, uh, relaxed photographs of uh, several of the governors of that era. Uh, Louis uh, Hanna, for one. Uh, he took the photograph that's now fairly famous showing uh, Governor Lynn Frazier uh, f uh, signing the Women's Suffrage Act in North Dakota in 1919, after it had been ratified, the uh, amendment had been ratified by the legislature. Uh, he also did an awful lot of the, uh, the usual landscape promotional uh, photography, uh, 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 fields of waving grain, uh, fields of uh, uh, animals and so forth, and sort of success story photography that was con considered important at the time. And he also represented the state in a number of uh, promotional programs. Uh, I think, for example, the, uh, in 1915, the state promoted a, uh, a program that was held here in Bismarck in an exposition building that was a former con was a converted hotel called Hogs and Hominy. <laughs> and he traveled through, uh, throughout the state to take images to be used for that Hogs and Hominy promotion. But I think most of us today remember uh, Fred Holmbo more for his motion pictures because he was the first man to really operate in North Dakota with motion picture photography. Certainly other photographers had been here earlier, but for the most part they were transients. He organized something called the Publicity Film Company and would make a deal with, uh, with towns, I'll say like Hazen, uh, Beulah, um, Steele, uh, Dickinson, to come into town on what was promoted as Market Day. A lot of people in town 
and he would shoot photographs of activity going on in that community, and then would come back and show the finished photographs uh, in the local theater a month or two months later after they'd been processed. Again, as I say, he worked closely with the, uh, with the state government, and so we have a tremendous collection of film of uh, the uh, National Guard when it was in camp at uh, Fort Lincoln, south of Bismarck, both prior to the Mexican border incident in 1916, and as they were uh, uh, brought in for the uh, uh, beginning at the beginning of World War I in 1917. Fortunately, uh, many of his films were saved. Uh, they were discovered about in the mid-1970s, stored in a historical society warehouse, and uh, they became the basis of three films that have gone to go under the generic title of Flicker Tale Flashbacks. And I think most people in North Dakota have seen uh, Flicker Tale Flashbacks and, of course, the fascinating view they give us of what North Dakota was like in the years around World War I. I'm curious, in terms of the changes of fortune of, of farmers in North Dakota, whether there were photographers photographing the poor crops and the beginnings of the dust storms and so forth in the 20s. No, they weren't. Uh, not very. That was something that came in the 30s, and they were not North Dakota photographers. Those were the farm, farm security uh, uh, agency people that were sent in from Washington. No, it was really just the opposite, because uh, promotional people were image conscious, and they wanted to show a fine, a, 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 a progressive image, a, a positive image. And so few photographers would go out and show something that really looked like it was a failure. They wanted lush crops, tall grain, uh, healthy animals. Uh, things that would make the state uh, look good and would perpetuate what uh, the state was trying to do in, in uh, trying to bring people into the state, the so-called myth of the garden. In other words, make the state look like it was a blooming garden, uh, even if it was a, at the height of the drought. As a matter of fact, the uh, North Dakota did have several state a every agencies to perpetuate that, promote that kind of image. Uh, the Commissioner of Agriculture and Labor was responsible for a number of years, but beginning in 19 and running until, I think, about 1933, we, in fact, had a Commissioner of Immigration in North Dakota uh, who was doing the same sort of thing, really, as the tourism people are today, except uh, in trying to promote immigration. They were hoping that people would uh, do something more than stay overnight. They wanted them as permanent residents. And uh, the two commissioners were both concerned with uh, perpetuating or uh, projecting a uh, progressive uh, modern image. And one of them, uh, a man by the name of Joseph Devine, in uh, 1925 hired a young Bismarck photographer to travel around the state on a motorcycle and bring back a series of promotional photographs that uh, Commissioner Devine could be used, could use for uh, publications, for sending to newspapers or for converting into lantern slides to uh, be used at programs around the country to promote immigration in North Dakota. And of course, most of many people in Bismarck will remember that young man as Russell Reed, who later became the superintendent of the State Historical Society and uh, served in that capacity almost for the rest of his life until his, his death in the mid-1960s. I'm curious about your perspectives on the value of, of these photographs you're talking about to us today in terms of their historical value, <clears throat> excuse me, their artistic value. What, what can they offer us as, as you will, artifacts today to be able to make use of? Well, they can offer us a detailed image of, uh, of for example, what, what a community looked like 50, 70, 100 years ago. Uh, I think one of my more, most fascinating experiences took place about 20 years ago, not long after I moved to Bismarck and went to work for the uh, State Historical Society. I had been fascinated by uh, steamboating, uh, river travel, uh, river transportation. And yet when I got to Bismarck and took a close look at what I knew had been a bustling waterfront at Bismarck, it looked nothing like what I assumed it should. So. 
obtain images with all the photographs that I had, could find uh, showing the Bismarck waterfront as it had been in the, in the classic days, the days of the 1870s and 1880s. And I went out one night and sat on the bluff looking, overlooking the river and tried to compare, see how it had changed. It had changed tremendously, but yet those photographs, those photographic images, were able to show me exactly where everything had been, and if someone uh, then or in the future were to come back and want to try to relocate the docks, uh, the warehouses, the other structures, the, the marine ways uh, where boats were repaired or pu pulled up for uh, the winter, those photographs would allow them to do that because they're a faithful representation of what things were like at a particular time in the past. And of course, uh, since that time, too, the photographs are in, in today when we have with our concern with historic preservation. They're an important source in trying to determine what buildings looked like uh, at an earlier time. Uh, even the few photographs that we're able to find of Fort Union are extremely important in uh, the reconstruction that's just been completed up there and getting a, an accurate reconstruction of the buildings that uh, uh, were originally at Fort Union. And in much the same way, uh, the few photographs that existed of the commanding officer's house, the so-called Custer House at, uh, at Fort Abraham Lincoln, were of tremendous value, plus in addition to uh, archaeological investigation, and determined just exactly what the original building looked like, how it might have changed over the years, and helped in uh, preparation of plans for the reconstruction. That's very interesting. I'm wondering, in terms of looking at this time span you're discussing, really post-Civil War to the mid-1920s, if you could kind of summarize what you feel are sort of the high points and changes that have occurred in the kinds of images projected of North Dakota. Well, first of all, of course, you had to have an image to, to project, and that, began, that meant the settlement period, or at least the beginnings of people coming out here. Uh, the first settlements, of course, were the military posts, uh, the first white settlements, anyway. And they were the target of uh, many early cameras. The image of the Native American, as I said earlier in the program, was something that fascinated people uh, around the country, around the world, as a matter of fact. And so uh, for photographers, concentrated on preserving that image and, to a certain extent, skewing the image uh, to give perhaps maybe an inaccurate or a more romantic notion of what those Native Americans actually looked at. Not necessarily the, the, uh, the image that they uh, were pro projecting at the time that, they, uh, uh, at the, time that uh, the, the photographs were taken. Promotional photographs showing uh, crops, good crops, uh, healthy uh, uh, animals uh, to promote uh, immigration for agricultural purposes. There was, was, was a great deal of uh, emphasis on that, both by uh, land companies uh, by, and by the, uh, by the state government as a way of enticing people to come out here. In other words, give them the best view of what a community might be like uh, is a way of trying to invite people into, into this part of the country. Um, in re more recent years, we have gone and we have become tendency to be a little more accurate in the image that we're trying to project. But yet, even today, if you look at the, the classic, some of the fine photography you see in uh, North Dakota Horizons, they show the best side of the state not the negative side. So photography throughout North Dakota's histories, I think, has been used more to show a uh, progressive and a, a upbeat image than it has been to show an accurate image of what was here. Uh, there was a certain amount of that, as I said, in the, uh, the farm security photographers coming out at the height of the drought in the, in the dirty 30s. But I think that's going to be the subject that somebody else is going to be talking about in another program. <laughs>
That's correct. Well, Frank, thank you for joining us today for Conversations in North Dakota History. This has been an opportunity to learn a little bit more about the earlier period of photography. I'm Virginia Heidenreich with the State Historical Society, and this is the close of our program in Conversations in North Dakota History.